Welcome to this week's Degrees of Science. Today we're talking about pollinator gardens and we're talking to an expert about this, Dr. Rachel Mallinger. She's an entomology professor at the University of Florida. Dr. Mallinger, thanks for joining us. What, You're how important, welcome. how important are when we start talking about the insects that are pollinators, how important are those, say, ecologically and economically for us that they do what they do? Insects are really important ecologically. They help plants reproduce. Pollination is a part of the process by which flowering plants reproduce. So without insect pollinators and without pollination, we wouldn't have a diversity of plants in our environment. And there are other ecological consequences. For example, pollination produces fruits and seeds. And so without those fruits and seeds, birds and mammals wouldn't have food in wild or natural environments. Those are some examples of the ecological consequences. And then economically, we know that insect pollinators pollinate a diversity of crops. About 75% of crops around the world depend on animal pollinators, primarily insects. And this is enormously economically valuable. Uh, for example, there was a study in Georgia that estimated that insect pollinators are worth about 350 million per year. Man, so is it mainly bees that we talk about or are there other insects that are important in this process? Right, bees are really important pollinators. They do tend to be really highly effective and that is because they actively collect pollen and they have hairs on their bodies that help them collect that pollen. So they're really good at moving pollen around. Other insects kind of accidentally pick up pollen when they're visiting flowers. Bees are really effective, but they're not the only pollinators. Butterflies also contribute to pollination. Flies contribute to pollination. Wasps contribute quite a bit. And then other insects like beetles even do some pollination. Really any insect that visits a flower could pollinate by moving that pollen around. Are we seeing a decrease in the amount of these pollinating insects? Yeah, there have been some studies that have found a decrease in insects generally, even in areas that are conserved, preservations. And there are other studies that have estimated specifically for bees that about half the species we have information for are declining and about a quarter are imperiled. Not all species are declining. Some seem to do really well in human managed habitats, but we do have evidence that a number of species are declining. And pollinators that are really specialized, that require very particular resources, or that have a limited range that exist only in a small area to begin with, tend to be more vulnerable. So what do these pollinators need to help to kind of to be healthy, to build up their pop population? Pollinators need three main things. They need food, which comes in the form of flowers that provide nectar and pollen. But some pollinators need additional food as well. For example, butterflies in the caterpillar stage, they feed on foliage. So they need host plants that provide that foliage. And then as adults, they feed on nectar from flowers. Additionally, they need nesting resources. Many pollinators nest below ground, so they need ground that is accessible and undisturbed. Other pollinators nest in woody debris, debris or just on plants. And then finally, they need protection from toxins. And they need those food and those nesting resources to be in places where there isn't routine insecticide or pesticide use. So if someone was interested in making a pollinator garden or getting their garden more adapted for that, what, what would people need to do to help out with that? I would say plant flowers and look for native plants. Try to seek out native plant resources, things that might not be sold in the big box stores, but you may have native plant nurseries in your area. Look to provide a diversity of flowers. Different pollinators like different flowers. Some prefer white, some prefer yellow, some prefer blue purple, and some prefer red flowers. Also have a diversity of shapes. Some pollinators need flat flowers, or flowers without long, deep tubes. Others can access resources within those long, deep tubes. So aim for a diversity of flower colors, a diversity of flower shapes, and with an emphasis on native plants. So you, you mentioned this a little bit, but when you start people putting stuff on their garden to say herbicides and insecticides, how much does that hurt the process when it comes to getting the pollinators to going? Right, it is most detrimental when you're applying to flowering plants when they're flowering, that's when a lot of the pollinators are going to be visiting the plants, when they're in the flowering stage. And you really wanna avoid applying insecticides. Those are the chemicals that are designed to kill insects. 
So you really want to avoid applying insecticides when the plant is flowering. Additionally, try to find plants that are not treated with systemic insecticides. You can ask the nursery or the store. A systemic insecticide is one that will remain in the plant for longer and thus be toxic or potentially toxic to the pollinator for longer. If you're applying some kind of chemical when you're just establishing the plant and it's not yet flowering and that chemical is short-lived, that will have a lesser effect. So you were mentioning bees and wasps as two of the pollinators. What, what do you say to people that are worried about having bees and wasps possible in their yard to, to get stung or something like that? Great question. I think most people, when they have a negative reaction to bees and wasps, they're thinking about honeybees, maybe paper wasps, bees and wasps that have large social colonies. And actually, the majority of bees and wasps are not social. It's just an individual female. She maybe has a nest below ground or in a beetle burrow or a stem. She might only have a dozen offspring in her entire life. And these solitary bees and wasps are not aggressive. They don't have large colonies to protect. And so I can understand not wanting to have uh, colonies of aggressive social insects around, but I would say keep in mind that most bees and wasps are not social, they're solitary, they're not aggressive, and as long as you don't step or put your hand on them, they're not gonna bother you. So you're an entomologist, which is an interesting career field. What got you interested in insects and learning about them like you do? I was not a bug kid. Uh, I was not particularly interested in bugs and I wasn't even really an outdoor kid, but I got involved in science and biology from a really young age. I really liked science. And it wasn't until college, I did some research on insects for my senior thesis. And I also did a study abroad uh, where I spent a lot of time outside. And I just started to appreciate nature more and I started to appreciate diversity of plants and insects. And then I had that research experience, uh, which was looking at insects in apple orchards that really, uh, I was able to kind of put all those pieces together. My interest in biology, my interest in nature and the outdoors, and then also my interest in agriculture and in finding ways to produce food more sustainably. That's, that's very interesting. It's fun finding out how people kind of gradually uh, migrate to the career field that they follow. Well, Dr. Mallinger, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. A very interesting topic, and hopefully folks will uh, try to make sure they have those good pollinating plants out there for the insects. You're welcome.